If you remember logging on to AOL Instant Messenger to chat with your friends, you might be a 2000s kid. And to celebrate your passage into the mid-20s and the terrifying realities of adulthood, let's take a look back at some of the most nostalgic items from that time. From the Fushigi Magic Gravity Ball that was kind of a scam, to the tiny overpriced music players known as Hit Clips, I'm Mike with List25, and join me as I count down 25 things 2000s kids used to use. 25. Playing with Tamagotchis. Before we were all carrying around pocket-sized computers, there weren't many options for portable games. That's why when small egg-shaped devices called Tamagotchis hit the shelves in the late 90s, they swept the world through to the early 2000s. Uh, let me try to explain what the object of the game was. Basically, when you got a new Tamagotchi, you activated an electronic animal, which required all the things a real pet does, like food, attention, and discipline. The game was relatively simple, involving just three buttons, but it was an instant sensation, and the collectability of different animals helped turn over a billion dollars in the first year of its release. The good news is that if you're still craving a nostalgia kick for a Tamagotchi pet, there's actually a new generation available now. 24. Playing with Beyblades. If you saw a group of boys huddled around chanting and pumping their fists in the early 2000s, chances were it wasn't a fight, but a Beyblade contest. First released in the final year of the 90s, these were another Japanese toy that took the world by storm. Stylized spinning tops that do battle with one another, the toys were released alongside a manga and later a television series where characters would go head to head in intense fights, attacking, defending, and doing anything to throw the other blade off balance. Of course, in real life, the Beyblades never looked quite as cool, but that didn't stop them from becoming a huge hit all around the world, turning into competitions that still have a world championship today. 23. Heelys. For some reason, in the late 90s, a man named Roger Adams concluded that the time had come for walking to be reinvented. Which innovation was going to roll it forward? Well, by slicing open a pair of shoes and installing skateboard wheels inside. Adams called these shoes Heelys because of the position the wheels were located, allowing users to walk normally and then glide on wheels by flicking their toes into the air at a moment's notice. 22. Live Strong Bracelets In the early 2000s, almost every shop counter had rubber wristbands for sale with the words Live Strong imprinted on them. Soon, they were available in a variety of colors and styles, but always with the same word, and distributed over 70 million all over the world. So. What were they? Well, they were launched by the Live Strong Foundation, which was started by famous cyclist Lance Armstrong as a nonprofit to fight cancer. If you don't know, Armstrong won the Tour de France seven times in a row between 1999 and 2005, despite having testicular cancer. However, his fairy tale ended when he was later stripped of all his titles as evidence of doping came to light. He also stepped down from Live Strong, and the charity has been dwindling ever since. 21. LAN Parties. Here's one thing 2000s kids will miss. LAN parties. Now, the internet is fast, cheap, and accessible basically anywhere in the world. But back in the early 2000s, the best way to have a gaming night with your friends was to lug your computer to a friend's house. It was much faster and more efficient for multiplayer games because it used a LAN connection, which stands for Local Area Network. It's the same kind that your old school or library would use. Kids today will never know how much effort it was to pack up and move those huge PCs for a night of entertainment, but it was so worth it. By the end of the night, there would be empty pizza boxes boxes, soda bottles, and chip bags everywhere. Now we just all connect through the internet. No more lands. I'm mean, sure people probably still have land parties. I'll be right back and we're gonna play some Harry Potter. Yeah. 20. Silly Bands. If you were too young to care about Lance Armstrong's yellow charity bracelets, there was a different, fun version called Silly Bands. Of course, it was written with a Z. Instead of a boring circle, though, these pieces of rubber formed a ton of different shapes, from dogs and fish to bananas and trees. But when they're stretched out, they look more or less like a normal wristband, just a little out of shape. These days, they're still traded online, and according to one collector, the most expensive is the fluorescent tie-dye penguin, valued at around $500 a pop. Wow. All right. 19. AIM. AOL Instant Messenger. How do you contact people these days? Facebook? Snapchat? WhatsApp? Most of us are constantly connected and never more than a message away. In the early 2000s, however, mobile phones were still slowly on the rise, and the options were usually a landline home phone or AOL Instant Messenger, aka AIM. Launched in 1997, it quickly became a standard of online communication. By today's graphics, the interface is extremely basic, but it allowed users to chat in real time and 
helped create some of the internet's shorthand. GTG, gotta go. BRB, be right back. And those are two phrases we almost never use these days. When was the last time you used gotta go or BRB? 18, tech decks. In the late 90s and early 2000s, there was nothing cooler than skateboarding. The first Tony Hawk video game had hit the market and kids all around the world were hooked. The only problem was most kids were stuck in schools most days. The solution, fingerboards. Tiny finger-sized skateboards that could kickflip, grind, jump, and do anything else a real-life skateboard could do. The most popular of these were tech decks, which came in hundreds of different designs and styles and were even equipped with tools to fix them. The craze was so big that by 2011, the World Championship Trophy was presented by Tony Hawk, and the video drew over 7 million views. 17. Yo-Yo Game Sandbox Up until the 2000s, video games were relatively simple. Set path, key decisions or actions to make along the way, and an endpoint. The advent of sandbox games changed all of that. Game developers imagined creating open-ended worlds where players could more or less choose whatever they wanted to do. This led to the rise of classics like Grand Theft Auto with gigantic maps and much more control. These kinds of game structures literally open a new world to players, meaning that even after missions are complete, you can still continue roaming around, you know, just like in real life, hopefully with less crime. 16, the Fushigi Magic Gravity Ball. If you saw a Fushigi Magic Gravity Ball back in the early 2000s, you might've thought your eyes were deceiving you and that the ball was floating. In fact, they were part of an art form called contact juggling. And the company Fushigi claimed to be the first one to bring it to a mass audience outside of magicians. And contrary to the marketing of the Fushigi Magic Gravity Ball, what came in the packet didn't actually defy gravity. Instead, it was pretty much an ordinary semi-translucent ball. The real trick relied on careful sleight of hand and mastering a set of movements. Of course, that's something they never mentioned in the commercials, but that's what made the product so successful. 15, Juju Pets. Every generation has a new set of collectible toys, and for kids growing up in 2009, one of those was Juju Pets. The original were fluffy hamsters, which soon expanded to include dozens of other animals. On their bottom were two wheels, a small motor, and a speaker. <laughs> This gave them the ability to squeak a few sounds out and roll across the floor for small distances. <laughs> as simple as they sound, within just a few months of their release, there was a Juju Pet shortage, leading to a secondary market selling them for four times the price. And soon, a Nintendo DS game, and later, a TV show followed. Four, Bionicles. Lego is still huge and going strong, releasing successful products and movies. But at the end of the 90s, the toy company was declining in popularity. They needed a new series to hook kids and created it in the form of Bionicle, a new species of hybrid creatures, one part bionic, one part human. Lego developed elaborate storylines, drawing on themes from Maori culture, and the complexity paid back big time, bringing in the equivalent of $250 million in sale in the first year of their release. 13, DDR. Dance Dance Revolution. What's your favorite game at the arcade? Maybe a driving or shooting simulator. I was a big fan of Area 51 and the Jurassic Park driving game and the Star Wars. Well, the big hit of the 2000s was Dance Dance Revolution, a dance game, shockingly, with four buttons facing in each direction where the object was to hit them in sync with the music as they appeared on the screen. This was much harder than it first looked and instantly swept through Asia, Europe, and North America, continuing even today. To date, there have been 23 releases, including versions that brought the arcade onto home consoles like the PS2 with portable dance pads. Arcades kept them because of consumer demand, but due to constant repairs, maintenance, and low earnings, they weren't the most profitable machine to have and have become increasingly rare to find. We're actually about halfway through this list, so now would be a good time to remind you to like, share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It's the best way that you can help our channel grow. 12, downloading ringtones. There's a reason people from a certain generation all keep the generic ringtone on their phones. It's because not long ago in the 2000s, the only way to get yourself a unique one was to buy it, usually around $5 a piece which would actually equal about $8 today. This made it a huge part of the music industry. And by 2004, people were spending a total of $4 billion a year on ringtones. This golden era for the ringtone market lasted well into the iPhone era, with iTunes offering the conversion of almost any song into a bite-sized ringtone version. But as software became more accessible, the ringtone market declined significantly. 11, disposable cameras. Photography is another industry that's been permanently changed by mobile phones. In the early 2000s though, a vintage technology was still hanging on, the disposable camera. You could pick these up at pharmacies and supermarkets with the operation pretty straightforward. Just 
point and click. A small dial would let you know how many photos were left. Once you reached the end, you took the entire camera to a shop that processed the film, usually for just a couple of dollars, to get a physical version of all those snaps. That's what's actually led to a resurgence of disposable cameras, which have become a throwback technology to use for weddings or in viral social media videos where influencers hand them to travelers. 10. Burning CDs By the early 2000s, the music world had almost entirely moved on from cassette tapes to compact discs, or CDs. The biggest advantage of these discs was that you could arrange personalized playlists and copy them onto them yourself, a process called burning. It got this name because that's actually how the technology itself works. A laser is used to literally burn data onto a disc. How did one come across this music to share freely? I'll actually get to that later. 9. The Crazy Frog for anyone watching who grew up in the 2000s, I'd like to apologize before reminding you of this dark time in history. At one point, the crazy frog was unavoidable. The song came from a young Swedish music producer and was brought to life by an animator in the form of a strange, sickly looking gray 3D frog. For some reason, the song became a huge hit and was used in a Hollywood movie and became one of the most popular ringtones of all time. To this day, some sadistic people return to watch the original video on YouTube, which has garnered four and a half billion views. 8. LimeWire Now back to the vast world of music sharing that peaked in the 2000s. Long before legitimate streaming platforms like Apple Music or Spotify, there were only two options to access music. Either buy them in physical or digital form at a pretty high price, or download them illegally. Naturally, most people tended to opt for the second option, especially young people without money. And the most popular software to do so was called LimeWire, which allowed peers to share files with each other. With LimeWire, users could search, download, and share freely. Of course, this was all illegal, so you were never completely sure if you were downloading your favorite album or a malicious virus. And for some reason, every comedy song ever was accredited to Weird Al, so if you didn't know who it was by and it was funny, it was clearly Weird Al. When music labels eventually took the company into court, they claimed that LimeWire had robbed them of $75 trillion. That figure was thrown out, and the final settlement was $100 million, bringing the iconic LimeWire era to an end. 7. Minesweeper What on earth did people do on computers before the internet was readily available? On a PC, the answer was usually Minesweeper, or Solitaire. If you've never seen this game, it's made up of a grid of boxes, and the objective is to click squares while avoiding the mines, which are distributed randomly. With each click, an open cell reveals the number of mines surrounding that square. Through logic and patience, players sweep the entire board. Created by Microsoft, Minesweeper has been called the most successful game in history, as it came pre-installed on Windows from the 1990s up until Windows 8 in 2012. 6. Guitar Hero up until 2005, wannabe musicians had only one option to lick out their rock star fantasies, learning an instrument. With the release of the video game Guitar Hero on the PlayStation 2 or Xbox 360, playing like a rock god suddenly became accessible to everyone. The game didn't involve any real musical notes, but instead different colored buttons fashioned like frets on a plastic guitar. Don't get me wrong, Guitar Hero was by no means easy. It did require coordination and strumming. And for those who remember the game, you'll remember the near impossible song, through the fire and the flames. Guitar Hero was a massive hit. Within the first three years, it passed the milestone of one billion in sales in North America alone. I guess everyone secretly wanted to be a rock star. I actually preferred Rock Band. I thought it was way cooler to have different instruments, not just guitar. So, Rock Band was my thing. Which, which instrument did you play in Rock Band? Let me know in the comments. Five, playing with hit clips. While kids were going crazy burning CDs, there was also an explosion of MP3 players to make music more portable. Not literal explosions, however. That wouldn't come until the Galaxy 7. Some of these, like the ones made by Sony or Apple's iPods, lasted longer than others. And one novelty product lost to history was the hit clips. These tiny devices were more of a toy than a music player. They couldn't hold a complete song, only had a cartridge that played a snippet of a song, and were marketed instead as collectibles, even included in McDonald's Happy Meals at one point. The name hit clips came from the way these tiny devices would clip onto belts, backpacks, and keychains. You know, looking back, 60 seconds of music was definitely not worth a $20 price tag of a player. That seems insane, but it actually somehow made sense back then. 4. Rented Movies at Blockbuster Believe it or not, life was more simple before Netflix and other streaming services. It might have been a little more difficult to access movies and TV shows, but at least once you made a decision, 
you stuck to it, rather than scrolling for hours looking for the perfect thing to watch. In the early 2000s, Blockbuster Video was the place to go for any rentals. By 2004, the rental video chain had over 9,000 stores dotted around the world, and that year brought in almost $6 billion of revenue. Today, it's pretty clear the reason for Blockbuster's decline. The increased availability of media online, especially Netflix, left Blockbuster with no space to compete. Three, watched TRL. In the days when music videos weren't released on YouTube, all eyes were on MTV for all things music related. One of the programs was Total Request Live, or TRL, which featured voting segments, a live audience, and high profile artists. The show lasted until 2008, with the finale featuring some of the biggest names of the 2000s, Beyonce, Fall Out Boy, Taylor Swift, and Eminem. Two, MySpace. Growing up in the 2000s and looking to connect with friends online, the best place to go was MySpace. Back then, no one could have imagined Facebook would win this contest. On MySpace, users could customize their homepage, add music, display images and decorations, and much more. It turned out that people preferred a more simple design with fewer choices. By 2007, MySpace had 300 million registered users, all of which were automatically friended with one of MySpace co-founders, Tom Anderson. However, over the next few years, Facebook continued to lure users away from MySpace which never recovered and is now barely functioning. Those who grew up with it will never forget how political the top friends category could become at school. It was top five, I think, at first. I forget what it expanded to, but it used to be, I believe, top five. One, iPods. I've talked about MP3 players and hit clips, but nothing compared to the iPod, which became the most sought after music device at its release in 2001. All of a sudden, music lovers could hold thousands of songs in their pockets. Over the next decade, six generations of the original iPod were released, followed by a mini, a nano, and a shuffle, paving the way for the first iPhone, which changed the world as we know it. Now, I actually preferred Zune, and if anyone has an old working Zune and doesn't mind sending it to me, I will take your Zune off your hands. <laughs> Let me know. Now, I've been talking a lot about the 2000s, but guess what? We've done several other videos on different decades, like 25 activities 90s kids enjoyed that are rare for today's kids. I recommend checking that video out right now. 